You could be equally as good, equally as talented, equally as everything, but what's in your chest? How's that beating? What are you thinking today? That's what really matters. You want pressure, you want expectations, let's go. You've been doing this since you're six, so why would you run away from that? Embrace the target. These are the kind of things that get in the way. How does he wear his uniform? Does he have a beard? Does he have an earring? Does, does he color his hair? Who cares? Who cares? Joe Madden, welcome to Baseball Stories. Thank you, Jason. Thanks for Jay, thanks for being in Hazleton, man. Yeah, it's at cool the to Valley be, Country Club, right here. It is cool to be in yeah. Hazleton. You know, I'm always interested in how people live their lives after they do that thing right. that they've waited their whole life to do. Mm -hmm. That was you. In 2016, you won the World Series. This is going to be a tough play. I know that was a life-changing event for millions of people, but how'd that change you, Joe? Uh, I, I don't want to be disappointing, uh, but you know, <laughs> it's, it was what I was uh, assigned to do. I mean, that's why I got signed to go to Chicago. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce the manager of the Chicago Cubs, Joe Madden. First of all, it's ownership, it's Theo and Jed, it's the, the, the players themselves, and then hopefully the, the method that I employed helps somewhat. But, I don't know, I mean, more recognizable, like I went to the coffee shop this morning and some Hispanic guy, uh, Dunkin' Donuts on the way out, wanted to take my picture. That would not have happened several years ago, I understand that. But uh, it's given me uh, probably even a, a larger soapbox to stand on. I'm trying to utilize it uh, in a lot of uh, philanthropic ways. I respect 90 Foundation as an example. You're talking about Chicago. We just recently had an event there to help promote boxing, youth boxing in Chicago. We do respect ball. We shave our heads in uh, Arizona to help pediatric right. cancer research. Our thanks miss uh, program also that benefits in Tampa, Chicago, Hazleton, and we haven't done it in Arizona yet. So the point is you become more noticeable. Obviously, you're on TV all the time. Uh, but for me internally, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's uh, the culmination of all the years that the work that I've done and outposts that people have no concept of whatsoever. Regardless of any <laughs> recent books that have been written, there's no, there's no real understanding of what I've been through. Uh, people become confused in what I do sometimes when they watch me on a baseball field, but it's all, it's all tried and true and tested. Um, so I, I, don't, I don't feel any different. Um, I, um, I just think that it provides or permits uh, a stronger voice. I, I feel like I have a stronger voice, if that makes any sense. Sure. And I'm not, uh, I'm less um, <clears throat> uh, intimidated in a sense uh, from using it. I, I want to use it. And if you don't agree with me, that's fine. I'm just telling you what I think, not what I've heard. And that's one of the, the precepts and principles I have with my coaching staff and players. A regurgitation is a really poor method. Give me something new and fresh. Well, mm -hmm. um, in, in terms of baseball, yep. there's no sense of what do I do next? No. Honestly, I, I'm, it, again, I don't want to be disappointing. It's no. on an annual basis, I, you know, even when I was in the minor leagues, oftentimes you get dealt a bad hand. I mean, you just don't get a good team, but you feel like, I felt like we're going to win every night. So um, I'm looking for the next one. Uh, I've been to the World Series three times now, believe it or not. That's kind of crazy cool also. I mean, three teams? Two, yeah, three different teams, eight, two American League, one National League. Um, come close several other times with the Cubs too. I, I just look at it, this is my job. Uh, I put it down at the end of the season uh, and then I move on to spring training, but um, it's no pats on the back. It's none of that kind of good stuff. It's just what I'm supposed to do. Well, all right, let me ask you this. What, what about your players? Do you think that they're different? I, I, know it's, I know how hard it is to win once. Yeah. In some ways, is it harder to win twice? Uh, oh, absolutely, I think it is. Um, uh, easily, and, and a lot of it is just the, the built-ins. Um, the point is, you win it for the first time in 108 years, and all the stuff that's been written and talked about prior to that, a lot of people will be satiated by that in certain ways. And what, what do you do the next year coming out? Where's that same kind of adrenaline uh, juice flow, whatever you want to call it? You have to create it yourself more uh, readily, more, more consciously on a daily basis. So 
I want our guys to see with first time eyes. I want to feel it with first time passion. That's what you need to trick yourself into. That's how you repeat. Um, you could be equally as good, equally as talented, equally as everything, but what's in your what's in your chest? How's that beating? What are you thinking today? That's what really matters. And the group that's able to um, generate the right kind of thoughts daily and incorporate the right kind of energy daily, that's the one that has a chance to repeat and get back there again. I mean, you're a motivator, and this is something that motivators face, not just in baseball or sports, but in life. Yep. After someone has achieved something, how can it possibly be as important to them as it was the first time? And so that's my point. And you got to convince them that it would be, I mean, or that it is. And almost every time, if you watch, like you watch the great basketball teams of the recent past, um, I think they're equally as excited the next time they want it as the first time. The journey isn't always as excited. No, the, no, the journey's <laughs> going to be different. And that's where our journey last year, how about our journey last year? Um, really bad start. Um, didn't kick it into the All-Star break and then did. And then kind of ran out of gas getting to the uh, finals against the, the Dodgers last year. But I don't expect the journey to be the same on an annual basis. And that's sometimes people become confused. Because we got off to such a great start in 15, everybody's looking for the great start every year and being 20 games over 500. And it just doesn't work that way all the time. I mean, people come at you differently too. Don't, that's part of it also. They recognize you as being good. Uh, the prep's different, uh, the motivation for them daily is different. So you got to be on your best uh, baseball behavior. And I love that, don't get me wrong, I, I love expectations. I love the word pressure. I think those need to be attached. to If, if you really want to do the best you possibly can every day, you need to uh, kind of like put that tattoo on, you, on yourself <laughs> to remind yourself. Because if, you uh, if you feel pressure, that's a good thing. That means something worthwhile is at the end of this. And if there's expectations, that's good also because you're expected to do well. And who should expect more of you than yourself? And then you get to Grant Park, you get on that stage, and I'm looking at Cupstock, man. I am Richie Havens. I'm, out of, I'm the first act at Woodstock. That's exactly <laughs> what I thought. And I thought that was fabulous. I want to congratulate the people of Chicago, our fans, uh, our ownership, uh, Theo and Jed, the team, the players. I mean, uh, listen, it could not have been a more entertaining, difficult series to win. You cannot be more entertained than you were over these last seven games. It's incredible. Joe, what do you say we do a little film study? Go for I it. I want to show you some moments here. The first one is something you're <laughs> never going to forget. Of course. Last game. 2016 mm -hmm. World Series, it rained, and you had Thank a rain God. delay. That's one of the few times I love rain delays right there, man. <laughs> it, it mattered a lot. Um, I remember Joe West, I think it's going to show it up, came over and spoke to me. He said, I think he, if I remember exactly correctly, it was going to be about 17 minutes. I think that's what he said to me wow. in regard to the rain delay. And so we got to get off right now. They want to keep the field from getting uh, dramatically wet. Okay, let's do that. So uh, we get off the field. You know, Rawlis is a tough moment for him, but uh, I go back, I walk upstairs to check out the map on the uh, iPad. And as I'm walking up there, I see all the players peeling off to the right into the uh, weight room downstairs at the, in the uh, clubhouse. So the guys go in there and everybody said, the guy, the Jason's calling a meeting, Hayward, uh, to get inside the, uh, the weight room. And I knew I, was, I should not be part of that. So I went upstairs, continued to look at the weather map, talked to Jed Hoyer, who had come down, and uh, got my dad's cap. Uh, my dad's cap is over in the house right now, carries with me everywhere, and I took it and I stuffed it in the back of my, uh, underneath my hoodie, and you know, where the belt grabs it in the back, and just waited, and waited, went back down there, and um, walked back out on the field once the tarp was off. I can't tell you how energetic our guys were. It was an incredible moment to see that our guys were ready to play after all of that. So um, that's what I remember mostly about it. And, uh, and again, it's, it's more of a human thing as opposed to a numbers thing. Yeah, it's amazing that rain could have that kind of power. And you, know, you were involved in a rain delay in Philadelphia <clears throat> yeah. in the 2008 World well, Series. That, that was, was a disaster. <laughs> yeah, that was awful. I mean, that was, uh, I mean, I remember, I'm, I'm almost 100% sure there was a pop-up on the infield that the umpires neglected would not call an infield fly rule on because it was that dramatically bad. There's no such thing as routine pop-up. Right, pop and I said, well, then why are we playing? I mean, if you can't call an uh, uh, infield fly rule on a pop-up to second base because the weather's so bad, then why are we out here? Um, that game there was uh, the groundskeeper had said something about the field absorbs one-tenth of an inch of rain per hour. 
It exceeded that. <laughs> I, my, I knew my buddy Willie yeah. was sitting up in the upper tank with his son during the game, uh, and I'm looking up there, and the rain is absolutely horizontal. It's not, it's <laughs> whipping across, it's cold, <coughs> everybody's soaking wet, the field had a sheen on it, plus puddles. So you were involved in the worst World Series rain delay ever, and maybe and the, best. the best. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, because we, we, we took it to the uh, DuPont Hotel in Wilmington, and of course the Philly fans I knew we were there somehow, of course they did. So we were at five o'clock in the morning, six o'clock in the morning, fans circling, circling the hotel, blowing their horns, <laughs> trying to wake guys up. A uh, typical Philly wow. move. Yeah, typical. <laughs> All right, so we've seen that rain delay. Now let's take a look at something that happened after the rain delay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Look at this. Cool. Schwerbs. How about him? How about Schwerbs? I mean, he did not play the entire season. We're in Los Angeles. He walks in and says, I can do this. So we sent him to Arizona and he just does this incredible <laughs> training program for a couple days. And then how about this hit down the third baseline? I mean, Zobrist, I mean, it just does not surprise that Zoe would do something like that. But Schwab getting back to playing Zobrist, Mr. Clutch for so many years, an incredible moment for us right there. The emotion is indescribable. It's and does, indescribable. does any of this happen without that ring? I don't think, I honestly don't think so. I, I, I it's, we had to regroup, you know, there was no time to regroup after the home run by Davis and, um, you know, bullpen wise, there was only certain guys that wanted to use in that game. And uh, it just, it was very fortuitous. It was, it could not have been more fortuitous. <laughs> I can't emphasize that enough. Nice you believe throw. in divine intervention? Well, now? I mean, like right there, uh, KB slips, but still makes a good throw to Rizzo. I mean, I remember that and I'm just looking, oh my God, he slipped. I'm thinking that and then it's, it's face high to Riz. And the first thing I can think of is 108 years. That was the first thought that flashed for me. 108 years, the moment he caught the baseball. 108 years, because that's all you've been hearing about since yeah, and it, in Chicago? Yeah, and you know what? It's, 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 it's about all the people involved in those last 108 years. I mean, you hear from, um, I'm, I was, I'm a late national leaguer. I'm with the Cubs, so it's only my what, second year with the Cubs. So it's kind of like, you know, I'm just on board. I'm not used to losing anyway, you know? So you expect to win. Uh, but the people that have been suffering for a long time, I mean, there, there's this, this moment that everybody has felt felt redeemed in a sense with, and you know, going to grave, gravestones, to having shots and beers with, with uh, members that are no longer here, uh, walking on the street, people that, oh my God, I've been a Cub fan for years, and my grandpa or my dad is not here, my mom. I mean, it's just incredible, the, the connections that are involved in that, that one game. Yeah, absolutely. All right, we've, we've seen that. Now, here's what that led oh, to. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it was you recognize cool. this? Oh my God! This is a parade, uh, well, man. They said we're going to have a parade, but that was like, wow. Uh, we get to the ballpark, and of course, these buses are lined up around the periphery of the outfield. We're all assigned a different bus, and you can see people right around uh, Wrigley. You know, of course, uh, hanging out. But you make the turn onto Addison, you're starting to go down towards Lakeshore, and it starts building and building. Even the perpendicular streets, people are like, oh my God, how many folks are like back? just wanting to catch a glimpse for a moment, get eventually to Lakeshore, we're going to Lakeshore and it, the, the traffic is stopped on the other side looking at us, going all the way down, then you get down to Michigan and here we go. And you go down Michigan, that's like the most incredible, that is by Could, the most incredible moment of my life. Right I mean, can you put into words what the emotions were that you felt watching this unfold? Oh yeah, I mean, again, it's, it's, it's gratification, it's satisfaction, you're happy for everybody. You're happy for everybody. What about for you? Well, I mean, of course, but I mean, <laughs> that, I, I don't, I'm, I'm happy, but look at, I'm happy for all of that right there. I, yeah. I'm, I don't know, that's just, that's just the way I'm, I'm wired. Um, it's not, it's, I've always tell myself in the dugout during the game, it's not about me, it's not about you. It's, you know, just really be focused on what it is all about. And then you get to Grand Park, you get on that stage, and I'm looking at Cup stock, man. That's exactly <laughs> what I thought, and I thought that was fabulous, because that, Whenever I've seen videos of Woodstock, I'm always like, wow, how about that? What did those guys feel like? And then that's when I had my little aha moment. That was pretty cool <laughs> that I got on that stage, was able to say a couple words in front of Cubstock. That was awesome. Yeah. Joe, the, the, the largest gathering of human beings in the history of North America was not Woodstock. <laughs> it was this. Yeah. What does that say about what your team did? Well, obviously, I mean, that just tells you the love. Uh, the Cubs uh, brand, the Cubs team is, uh, is unique throughout the United States, maybe throughout the world. I mean, we're really fortunate to have uh, those folks backing us. That city itself is a, is a really a spectac spectacular city too. Um, I feel very fortunate to be part of it. Again, I'm late, I came to the party a little bit late. So it's for them, it's for the folks there, it's for the fans, it's for the ownership, it's for that city. Um, 
the fact that Jay and I are able to call us, you know, be part of that right now is pretty special to us too. Very cool. Yeah. Joe, you spent a lot of time talking about your different artwork, your yeah. Mona Lisa. Here is the Mona Lisa. There she is. Tell me what your purpose is behind this artwork. I've been wanting to do this for years. I mean, years since I was a Ray. Um, I thought it'd be a great preseason promotion campaign for a team, putting the art back into the game, the game of baseball. I tried to sell it to the Rays. They didn't want to do it. I actually <laughs> tried to sell it to the Cubs, and I did not get a lot of traction there either. So I said, I'm going to do it myself. <laughs> so this past off season, I'm looking for the theme for this season. And I walk into my favorite clothing shop in Tampa, and there she is, not like that exactly, but up on the wall. And I'm reading the book by Walter Isaacson about Da Vinci. I said, man, I'm going to do it. I just That was my seminal moment. That was my epiphany. That was the light bulb. I'm going to do it. So putting the art back into the game, starting with her, the Mona, and she's pretty much got a whole bunch of um, uh, items written on there that I really subscribe to. But I wanted to include the eye black, the bat, the batting gloves, etc. And then a lot of this is Jason Skeldon. He's the artist. He did a great job of putting his own touches, the landscape of Chicago in the back, all that stuff. But the message is, for instance, we are first to third, score first, score last. Um, play catch equals 27 outs because Renaissance chicks really dig the leather. <laughs> I wanted to make sure I got things. I'm really into the defense, as you know. So all these little items are on this particular painting. Uh, I also, it's just, it just it's, uh, appealing to the eye. I wanted to uh, appeal to the players as artists. In the spring training, your first meeting is um, your first meeting. You've got to make an impression. I can't say a whole lot of different things that I've been saying the last three years, but I could say them in a different way. So I thought art, visual arts, would really help present the, the project. So I chose to do that, putting the art back into the game to present athletes as artists. So that was number one, to create a theme. Number two was to raise money for the foundation. And number three was to promote the arts in the city of Chicago and beyond. You get caught up as a spectator in a game sometimes. I don't want to spectate. And that's DNBF. Do not be a effing fan. In other words, again, don't get caught spectating. feeds into mm -hmm. like one of the most iconic of all the slogans, which was 2016, yeah. embrace the target. the target. Yeah, and you know what that happened? I mean, we were in the, uh, the um, in 2015, we we're in the winter meetings. I'm sitting in that little scrum that you do, you know, the manager's scrum, and um, it was brought to my attention about 2016 after 2015, you know, such a good season, where are we going? I said, we got to embrace the target, and that's true. I think, um, and again, that's do not permit the pressure to exceed the pleasure. That is, see it with first-time eyes. It's all this stuff in, in one, uh, three words to embrace the target, meaning you want pressure, you want expectations. Let's go. Let's go. You've been doing this since you're six. You want to play in the World Series and win it. You want to catch, make the last out or catch the last out. Um, here it is. So why would you run away from that? Embrace the target. The fact that you are good. People are shooting good. That should bring out the best in you on a daily basis, I think. And then if you get the whole group thinking that way, that's what it really matters. Uh, it's, 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 there's so many ancillary components to our game that people overlook. Everybody just focuses on bullpens and bullpen usages, usage and sometimes a lineup, and they miss the nuance of the game entirely. The innuendo of the game, the real importance of the game. Our guys get it. Yeah, and I know you've been known to jot those sayings yep. on your lineup card. Yeah, this it. is cool because you brought a couple of lineup cards with you. I would love for you to yeah. show us <clears throat> what's on these cards and all the different things that you use them for. Well, yeah. Um, well, this is the, the recent series against the Mets. Um, we just came off a, a good four-game series there. And part of it's consistent, and that's my scribbling on it every morning. I, <laughs> I, change, it, I change it on an annual basis. and uh, Show us some of the stuff yeah, that you've scribbled. Well, this year, well, some, it of it's, some of it's the same. Uh, C plus B equals L. That's my uh, bracelet here. That's courage plus believe equals life. I got that from John Chalice. A uh, young man that died from, uh, I think it was um, pancreatic cancer in wow. 2008 in Pittsburgh. I met him. I just left his dad tickets. We just played the Pirates. But the, the revealing component of this to me is that how could you think courage plus believe equals life when you're 18 or 19? The only way is because your life's been accelerated. 
through a, a really horrible disease. So John said that. I love it. I keep it on my wrist all the time. Why would you write it on your lineup card? Because I want to remind myself of that every day. I don't want to be. I don't want to become um, kind of jaded in a sense, or you, you just forget the real motivation uh, from what we do on a daily basis. John had it down. Courage plus believing equals life. There, wow. He had it, Great. and I don't want to forget it. Um, H is from my dad. That was his nickname, Howard. <laughs> Even though that wasn't his name. Right. My dad's name was Joe, <laughs> but he I, I always uh, regurgit, regurgitated whatever Howard Cosell said during the football <laughs> game. So me and my brother Mark called him Howard. Uh, number eight's for Yogi, uh, so I put Yogi there. Uh, do not permit the pressure to exceed the pleasure. Just the first letters, again, to remind myself. Uh, then these are recent and some past deceased relatives and friends. Wow. That's the first initials of their names. And then I, I also include watch. Uh, and I put a smiley face on it. So you get caught up as a spectator in the game sometimes. I don't want to spectate. And that's DNBF. Do not be a effing fan. In other words, again, <laughs> don't get caught spectating. You know, the moment you start wishing and hoping for something good to happen, it's a bad process. That was taught to me by Lloyd Christopher, a great scout uh, from the Bay Area in San Francisco, played for the San Francisco Seals. He told me never to hope in a baseball game. He's absolutely correct. Um, so uh, <laughs> that's part of that. And then I wrote uh, C-I-W-1-S-T-T-E, C with first time eyes. That's on the Mona Lisa this year. And again, uh, you got to keep things fresh. Keep things fresh. C with first time eyes. Looking at the golf course as an example. We just purchased a home here recently. I used to play golf here with Uncle Jack. Wow, how cool. It always wows me every time I come down here. This, this the Sugarloaf Valley, where we live now and is at part time, is one of the most beautiful valleys anywhere. Anywhere. You go to Europe, go throughout the United States, anywhere. So this always wows me. I always try to see it with first time eyes. And then the game. That's on the Mona Lisa. Um, we're putting the art back into the game. Uh, I don't want anybody to become confused. Football's not the game. Basketball's not the game. Hockey's not the game. Soccer's not the game. There's only one the game, and that's baseball. And I don't ever want anybody to become confused with all the rhetoric about um, you know, people not being as interested in the game, the pace of the game is slow, there's too many strikeouts. I'm into organic change with everything. It is the game, it's always gonna be the game. Everybody's gonna wanna see Javi Baez play baseball. Everybody's gonna wanna see uh, Chris Bryant play baseball, Anthony Rizzo, the whole group that I have out there. Johnny Lester Pitch, um, Brandon Morrill come out of the bullpen, the passion of Wilson Contreras, don't, don't, be confused. This is this is the game, and and look beyond a strikeout or a walk or or whatever. It's it's the most fascinating intellectual game out there. Pay attention, pay attention. Just don't get caught up in in this this uh, superficial minutia of the game. Pay attention. Um, below well, that, first, wait, go ahead. I mean, I love all of this, mm -hmm. but what's fascinating is. Every day mm -hmm. you write this on your yeah. lineup card. Mm -hmm. As a reminder, uh, it's for you, right? Yeah. No, that it's... reminds me of everything. Absolutely, this is, serves, as, uh, serves as a reminder for me, again, to not ever take advantage, never, never take for granted, never lose focus. Every game counts. Every day matters. If you, if you apply it on that with that kind of mentality daily, then you can re keep it fresh and keep it going for a long time. If you lose sight of that and become jaded in any way, shape, or form, do something else. Just do something else. 162 games every <laughs> night. We played in New York yesterday. I'm here today. I'm flying from Philadelphia tomorrow. It's an hour and a half, two hour ride from here tomorrow morning to get to Chicago for a night game tomorrow night against the Phillies of all things. So yeah. don't, if you lose that energy, if you lose that, that, that baseball source within you, stop doing it. Stop doing it. Don't do it. It's, yeah. too, it's too tough. Yeah. And so your rituals mm -hmm. are part of the way that you keep that daily energy Flowing, it's, all about, it's all about routine, and it's not superstition. It's routine that matters. It's this method that you incorporate every day. Um, from my cup of coffee in the morning with the, the bulletproof oil and some butter, I sit at my favorite coffee shop in Chicago. I, I'm able to watch videos via Wi-Fi. I could check out things for today and tomorrow and the next day, uh, over, uh, look over some of the data points, and then read whatever I want to read and hang out and listen to music. That's a big part of my day. That is, I've been doing that since I was, I don't know, a, a coffee paper take my time that was always my motto <laughs> now it's coffee iPad take my time and uh, although I really want the papers to hang in there um, yeah so th this is what I do every day bike ride after that some form of exercise after that 
uh, drive a funky car to the ballpark, love that, great stereo system, that, that matters. And you get to the ballpark and you start your conversations. Um, and then when the game, be the, the easiest part of the day really is the game, in a sense, because you've put to bed all this other ritual, ritualistic stuff that you have to do on a daily basis, and then just enjoy this, this art, art, artistic moment, and it is. It, so that's, that's it. Now, Joe, the way you think is so interesting to me, because mm -hmm. I think people look at you as a non-traditionalist, which mm -hmm. I, I think you agree is accurate, right? And yet... I'm a non-conformist. I'll, I'll go with that. <laughs> I'm, I'm a heavy traditionalist, but I'm a non-conformist. Okay, well, that's that was the point I was going to yeah, make. Yeah. You do have a traditional side to you. Yeah. You've got all this information, mm -hmm. but isn't part of your thinking when to use it and when not course, to use it? Of course. It's... Hey, whenever you want to be bipolar, just go one way or the other. I mean, you can't be you can't be too conservative. You cannot be too liberal with all this stuff. You can't be all about analytics, and you can't be all about the heart. You have to find that balance in there somewhere. Um, I watch, obviously, we all do, and you can see the the groups that are uh, heavy and too heavy, I think, analytically, and then maybe too heavy non-analytically. -analyt yeah. And um, so, for years with the Rays, we were beating people because people were frowning upon what we were doing. And then now everybody's caught up. I mean, the, the edges are so, the margins are so minute right now that you have to, to really uh, do something um, noticeably different that's, that's, that's gonna help is almost impossible. It's so hard to do. It's, well, that's my point. I think it's really come back. The game is, it's gotten so comp or complex in a, in a sense analytically that it's forced you to get back to really just playing good baseball. Uh, launch angle, you could keep a launch angle, you could keep an exit velocity, it has nothing to do with anything. Um, strikeouts, the prolifer proliferation of strikeouts, I believe, are the residue of that concept of hitting, and now pitchers, what if pitchers doing? Elevated fastballs, you got no chance. Right. And when you're, when you're trying to lift the ball so much with this launch angle stuff, it's almost impossible to hit a line drive to left, or right center field if you're a right-handed hitter. It takes away the other side of the field in a, in a method that's productive. So. Um, Believe me, it's, there's a lot of tried and true in this game. First and third yesterday, we steal home plate. Uh, that had nothing to do with analytics, zero. Um, Jason Hayward talking to our group in, in Cleveland when it was raining out, nothing to do with analytics. That wins the game. I, I think there's, it's becoming a little bit um, uh, blurred in a sense. It is about the heartbeat. Utilize numbers, utilize data, but don't, don't become an extremist in either way. Learn how to balance all this stuff. These are the kind of things that get in the way. How does he wear his uniform? Does he have a beard? Does he have an earring? Does, does he color his hair? Who cares? Who cares? Let the celebration begin! The Chicago Cubs are NL Central champions once again, and they're gonna party in St. Louis. There's this thought now yeah. that chemistry doesn't matter and that's because I think people chemistry, don't understand it right it's culture of course it matters right and you've been you <laughs> cultivate culture I've had that argument with Billy Vivace since the early 80s um, about you know they well chemistry will follow winning but what if you're not winning how do you create winning and you I think you create it by creating culture or chemistry first I think you know as a, as a as a species, we mock what we don't understand. In other words, if you've never been in a position or understood how to do that in the first place, create chemistry or culture, then you're gonna mock it. Then you think the easy way is to acquire all these great players or expensive players, put them together in one room and they're gonna win. That's, that's, that's a bad method, that's, that's an inappropriate thought. So if you've never done it before and you don't know what you're doing in regards to doing it, then you're gonna mock it and say that it doesn't exist. I cannot disagree more with that. And how do you, how do, you do that? How do you build a culture? Um, it has nothing to do with um, 50 extra swings, 100 <laughs> extra ground balls, or 1,000 extra PFPs. Build a relationship with the fellow. First of all, if you're a major league player, if this major league player is legitimately supposed to be there, he's good. He's good. He's a good player. He's a good athlete. So what do you do to make this group better as a whole that makes you better than these other teams that come in on a consistent basis? I think it's about building relationships first. And once that happens, then me and you trust each other. Once we trust each other, now we can exchange thoughts and ideas. Until we trust one another, you're gonna push back at my thoughts and I'm gonna push back at yours. But once you've achieved that, now here's the real rub, and this is what makes it all work. 
then you could be constructively critical of each other and then something good occurs after that. But if you don't accomplish those first three steps, that doesn't happen and then you don't have culture. You don't have chemistry. You don't have any of that because you're always pushing back at one another. So for years, for me, whether it's in a, uh, an industry or a, a factory or a, whatever, a law firm or a baseball clubhouse, if you fail to address those things first, if you get chemistry and if you get um, culture, you're kind of lucky. But believe me, man, it's, it's there to be done. It can be done, but you have to pay attention to those things first. That was my first thought when I went to Chicago, build relationships. And then I have, we have to trust each other and then they'll start listening to you, otherwise they won't. <laughs> yeah, and see, I, I see uh, one other thing that you use to build culture, and that is personality. Mm -hmm. Yours and theirs. I mean, you, mm -hmm. I, I've always thought, you allow players more personal freedom mm -hmm. than any manager that I can recall. And I know that's by design, right? That's the highest compliment you can give me, right there. Um, today we're auctioning off the uh, Uncle Sam painting. You, funny you should say that. Um, <laughs> one of our paintings uh, in this, uh, putting the art back into the game series is the Uncle Sam pointing out at you. And he's pointing at you and saying, we want you to be yourself on the bottom and on the top, uh, the more freedom given, the greater respect and discipline returned. If in fact my players feel that way, that would be, that would be the ultimate compliment because that's another part that's uh, under, under addressed, underutilized, under thought. How do you get this guy to be the best version of him? Don't be putting all these restrictions on him. Don't make him walk into the clubhouse on a road game thinking he's gotta wear a special suit and a tie to ameliorate some, somebody's thought from 50 years ago that doesn't matter. <laughs> you know, th these are the kind of things that get in the way. How does he wear his uniform? Does he have a beard? Does he have an earring? Does, does he color his hair? Who cares? Who cares? It, it, we make, it, sometimes in our game, uh, oftentimes, superficial, superficialities really get in the way. Things that don't matter. Batting practice is the most overrated thing we do every day. <laughs> Could not be more overrated. It's, you're just getting people tired. You're getting them arm weary. Um, there's so many methods that are outdated, not necessary, that get in the way of success. And primarily, going back to the relationship building, part of that is um, the freedom or the, and I hate to word, use the phrase, give them freedom, but the point is to not be restrictive. It sounds so logical when you explain mm -hmm. it, but mm -hmm. you had a really young mm -hmm. group when you got to Chicago. It's still a young group. Really Most young. managers would be afraid to give a group that young that much freedom, why weren't you? Because they're not in fifth grade. Uh, they can go to war, they can vote. Uh, they're men, they're married, they have kids, or they can if they're not, okay? So sometimes you gotta make mistakes too in order to grow up and become better at what you do. Um, I know I did, <laughs> I know I still do, <laughs> and um, I, I'm, I'm six, just turned 64, and uh, the old famous, I think it's Mark Twain, if, if I did not have a memory or a mirror, I would think I was 16. And, and it's true, I mean, I, I, the other night we were playing, we, we ended at one o'clock in the morning, won a tough game against the uh, Giants. I'm sitting there at one o'clock in the morning at my desk, exhilarated by the victory, thinking to myself, I feel like I'm getting on the bus from Reno to Salinas <laughs> at one o'clock in the morning with a couple beers in my bag. After that really, really ultimate moment of winning uh, a really hard fought game, the, the camaraderie involved, the teamwork involved to get that done, I have not forgotten what that feels like. Um, this, the method of always trying to create rules and regulations, I'm, I'm really anti that and I'm oftentimes said I'm really revealing my politics whenever I say that. I don't like to micromanage at all. I'm, I'm anti-micromanagement. I am more about empowerment. You, as a manager, you oversee things. I'm supposed to coach the coaches. That's it. And then the coaches are supposed to coach the players. And then the players are supposed to play. So there's this, if you create this pecking order of, of leadership, that even, that's, that's gonna work. Because the players aren't gonna come and say things to me as the manager that they're gonna say to the coach. They need to get it off their chest. And coaches gotta listen well to be really good coaches. So these are the things that I, again, if you really wanna build something successful, nurture these components first. And if you're talking about baseball, the last thing I'm worried about is this guy getting extra batting practice. <laughs> I know that that's true. Yeah. And um, I mean, you do do stuff that you're famous mm. for that people don't understand, mm. dress up day, yeah. anchorman, yeah. wear your favorite football jersey, right. whatever it may be. 
What's the method behind that madness? Again, much more important than 50 extra swings in a batting <laughs> in a batting cage. Um, the, the, it's all about uh, unity, camaraderie. It's all about having some fun. Um, uh, Jeff Ziegler uh, was our traveling secretary with the Rays, and Ziggy was a former cop in St. Petersburg. And he talked to me about them as, as police uh, people back in the day. And they try to treat every day like fun and games. And we in the baseball world, we're treating every day like life and death. It's really insanity <laughs> sometimes. And again, that goes back to the old mores and attitudes that have been uh, passed on from generation to generation. You know, the, whether it's the hard school, um, you know, the old manager, because the manager was autonomous. That manager used to, he totally exceeded um, yeah. um, GMs and almost <laughs> ownership. I mean, that's, they had that much juice back in the day. It was ridiculous. I didn't understand it. Um, so the, the road trips and all this stuff is about building unity, building camaraderie, and having some good old-fashioned fun and laugh a little bit. Don Zim, Zimmer. Zimmer in my Ed, my first one, the Ed Hardy road trip. And Ed Hardy t-shirts were popular. Zim sitting next to me in the plane with the boiler working really good with his ultra tight Ed Hardy and and he was sitting there laughing his butt off. I love I mean Zim Zim didn't get me at first either, but then he started to and like we became best friends. And we used to sit there and, and talk after games uh, whenever we were at home. But all this stuff matters. It's I can't it just lighten it up sometimes, people. You're, you're going to be surprised what happens in a positive way. Yeah, but you've asked grown men to walk through an airport in their pajamas. And of course. They're okay with that? Oh, yeah, they love it. Actually, they, they do. They, the onesies. They don't, no, no. It makes them a little uncomfortable, but not sometimes, at all. Don't you? Well, that's part of it, too, though. I mean, uh -huh. uh, a couple years ago, we did the um, we did Urban Cowboy from somewhere to Denver, and then I went at Midnight Cowboy from Denver to <laughs> New York City. So I wanted them to walk into the lobby at the uh, Westin. Um, in a theater district, all dressed up like cowboys. And what does it feel like when people stare at you? It's kind of, it's kind of interesting. And I, and I also believe that it, it can really, when you do that, guys come outside of their comfort zones by dressing in a way they would never dress. So I think that benefits you on the field also. I think that benefits you in a conversation. I think that benefits you finding your voice. The fact that you're fighting through, you're breaking, you know, this, this, this particular glass ceiling of yours that you have created that prevents you from being all of you. And that's true, and you know what I'm talking about. I've had, I've had it happen to me before, where we have these, we, we place this own restrictor place on ourselves that we'd love to get on the other side of this thing. <laughs> we want to get on the other side of this thing, but there's some kind of a voice or something, something that's from our past, our childhood, the way we're raised, there's teachers in school, coaches, that prevents you from doing it. I want to break that. And you can understand, you know, the, uh, the protesting that was going on. Not that I was a protester. I was. I had long hair. I wasn't. I wasn't a. I wasn't a druggie by any means. I liked. I liked alcohol. I mean, I drank scotch because Joe Namath did. I did stuff like that. <laughs> Bartender here. Barkeep anywhere? I got. I got the drinks right now. Okay. I got, what do I got? Round. What do I got? What? Theo. Theo said I got one round. No, actually, I had thought about that. So one round's on me, please. You know, I alluded to this earlier. Personality. You're, you've never been afraid to let your own personality yeah. show yeah. to help shape culture. Again, we live in an age where managers mm. aren't supposed to be that. Why are you not afraid to use your personality, let your personality shine? Um, I don't know 100% why. Uh, I think when I grew up and where I grew up matters. I mean, listen, I wasn't all of that here in Hazleton. I was pretty restricted. I went to parochial school. Uh, uh, left there in ninth grade to play football at D.A. Harmon and then play football in the high school, of course. Um, I was very shy, introverted, actually, growing up, I think. Really? Yeah, I, I really think I was. Um, I had, like, acne at that time. So, you know, you really get, you as a kid, I mean, all those things impact you as a young man or a young lady that, that could cause you to shell up just because, you know, you just felt uncomfortable. You didn't have that self-confidence going on. But by the time I got to college, that was the big part, going to Lafayette. Going to Lafayette and really meeting uh, kids from more uh, different places, uh, different backgrounds, uh, the more diverse nature of the of the element there. That's where I really blossomed and kind of took off. So don't, don't forget, that's like 1972. Um, so I think um, when my point is, I really learned to just not accept what people were telling me just blindly uh, when I got to that particular level. And I started challenging authority more. I finally figured out I was a nonconformist in a conforming society. That's yeah. what I thought. And you know, you could talk about you know the, the politics of the day and 
the presidents of the day and how that was all run back then. You can understand, you know, the uh, the protesting that was going. Not that I was a protester. I was. I had long hair. I wasn't. I wasn't a. I wasn't a druggie by any means. I liked. I liked alcohol. I, you know, I drank scotch because Joe Namath did. I did stuff like that. <laughs> but but um, I, I really uh, listened to my own voice, and inner voice too. And I learned over time to let it develop and, and let it out there more and more and more. So I think it began. Uh, it was nurtured here, but it began at Lafayette College. You've gone about this job, I think it's safe to say, uh, differently than anyone who's ever managed a baseball team because you're you. Yep. But do you think that you've left your mark? Do you think you've, you've changed managing in the 21st century in any way? Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm certain that I've had some kind of an impact because I was like one of the first guys. I might have been the first guy with a computer. You know, I, I, I wrote... Um, <laughs> I was telling Tommy Listell yet because Tommy's wonderful and he's very inquisitive. Uh, 1988 or 89, I took a Panasonic word processor to Mexico when I was helping Billy Latchman uh, with his uh, team in Obregón. And I wrote, I started writing this book on hitting that I have and I haven't really shown it to anybody yet. But, so I went from this Panasonic word processor to this 50 pound Toshiba laptop <laughs> that Billy Bebasi sells an avid note taker, note taker, note taker. How's a computer gonna help you win a baseball game? He said, listen, I never said that, but my notes are there keeps my, my thoughts organized and it helps me create a better day. So I wanted people to understand that. I used to take the stat sheet and I'd go through the stat sheet and I'd break down who is reverse split guys here. What righties hit, you know, lefties better and, and uh, or um, pitch the lefties better, et cetera. I got into reverse splits. Um, I would take these charts and I would scan them into legal size pages, right handed, left handed. I would break down the defenses for everybody on the team every for every series. I can't tell you how long that took me per series Bad. to do that. And then I would present. So I'd present the defenses. I'd present to the manager, this is your stuff for the night. And I would I would post stuff up on the wall to remind people during the game every day, every day. So a lot of the stuff that you're seeing mainstream right now, I'm not patting myself on the back and I don't care because it is true. I mean, this is even, even right down to uh, um, with scheduling, I did it on a computer. So, so you think that the that your impact has been you like in a way you were the first to use these sorts of analytics? Um, I, I would bet I'm close to that. If I'm not, yeah, right. um, I would think so. Even like you know, like when you talk about the shifts, um, leaving the third baseman at home for the bunt for one strike. I did that with David Ortiz. That's when I first started with David. So a lot of this stuff. Um, uh, listen, I'm I'm not taking credit for anything. I'm just saying I think that we were among the first to do this stuff. I think it's, uh, it's gotten a little bit out of hand. Um, there's so much unvetted information uh, and voices out there. It's a cowardly method of communication. I also think it's uh, depriving our, our younger generation from actually learning how to communicate. This is Warren. Warren, there you go. Middle reliever? Um, actually, long reliever. Look at that neck on it. <laughs> If you ask most people, especially people in Chicago and yep. Tampa Bay, they would say what they remember about Joe Madden is coolest manager uh, ever. <laughs> um, I'll take it. Um, you know, there's <laughs> listen. That's the, that's that's the nature of our society, though. In general, I'm really anti-social media. I, I I do Twitter only only to promote our events right. and things that I do there. I think it's uh, it's gotten a little bit out of hand. Um, there's so much unvetted information uh, and voices out there. It's a cowardly method of communication. I also think it's uh, depriving our, our younger generation from actually learning how to communicate. Everybody communicates via their thumbs. The actual eyeball-to-eyeball -eyeball conversation is becoming a thing of the past also, which is a bad thing. Um, you know, the, you, you watch the, the, the way politicians operate right now and, and the vitriolic, nonsensical stuff that's just tossed about with no uh, no respect. I think respect is really almost becoming an archaic word. So, and I and I do believe uh, social media is pro proliferating a lot of this uh, bad method right now. Wow. So, I mean, in your mind, the secret to to what you've accomplished is communication, of course. Yes. Connection, of course. Of course. Not just uh, technologically. Not not via. And I was one of the first ones to use email. I, I swear to God, when I figured, God, you mean I could send a, a letter? And I tried to. T Tell people about it. Nobody wanted to hear me. The old <laughs> AOL, wah, 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 hookup kind of thing. I, I was astounded by email. But uh, I've gone through all that. I've done all that. I still utilize some of it. But I really believe it's time. It's really time for us to really advocate 
eyeball to eyeball uh, communication, talking to people communication, sitting on your porch kind of communication. We're all isolated. Everybody's isolated in their devices. I walked down in the, in the um, uh, lobby in Cleveland recently. I was going to go out to dinner and I saw three of my guys, three of my players, sitting in the lobby on three different chairs, all into their devices, not anybody talking to anybody else. They're just right here. <laughs> but that's not just them. That's all of us. I'm guilty. I'm guilty, but I'm really making a concerted effort. Um, I'm, I, I really, I, I want to, I, I may bring back the pager, you know, as opposed to the, <laughs> to the cell phone. Just page me if you need me. Otherwise, I'm not that available. I hate being that available. I don't understand why anybody wants to be that available. It's just a bad method to exist as a human being. Well, let me tell you something. What we're doing here on Baseball Stories is we're bringing back the art of conversation. Cool. So hopefully you and I have just built something here. Absolutely, and we're putting the art back <laughs> in the game. We're putting the art back into the conversation also. But I appreciate it, man. Listen, I, this, is, this is my kind of an interview. You know, it's not just about, you know, what did you do yesterday and the hit and run and all this. No. It's, it's, it's about more important topics. And these are the kind of things that my guys are discussing. Uh, my, my players have had a lot of conversations during this last spring training. They get together, talk about everything but baseball. Well, Joe, if we've done anything here to bring back the art of conversation, this was all well worth it, but it would have been anyway. So, Thank Joe, you. Thank thanks you for both. joining us here at Baseball Thank, Stories. Thank you for coming, man. I appreciate it very much. Thank you.